Okay, so I first of all wanted to um, apologize for virtually attending this. I'm obviously in the United States and this was short notice, but I you know, wanted to introduce myself. So I, as a as way of background, I'm an MD PhD and I did my PhD with Julia Tononi in Wisconsin, but I'm also a, a neurologist and a sleep physician. So I'm very sleep focused and asking questions from a clinical translational perspective. But I also ask, um, I believe in open science and collaboration and the e-brain system um, is phenomenal to me. And, and so I really wanted to contribute and see how we can collaborate and use this infrastructure to advance science for the neuroscience community. So um, today I'm specifically gonna be talking about how sleep oscillations change after stroke. And to do that, I'm gonna start with some introductory slides where we all know that non-REM slow wave activity is associated, uh, that non-REM is associated with increased delta or slow uh, delta activity. That's the manifestation of, on the EEG by uh, waves that we think is the result of cortical pyramidal neurons firing on and off or up and down states. We also know that delta activity is associated with learning and memory. As an example, learning a visual motor task, which involves the right parietal region, will lead to local increases in delta activity. And the amount of delta activity you get that night seems to predict how well you do. So it's suggesting, and this as an example, and much other studies since then have shown that um, delta power is associated with learning and memory and plasticity. But there are other oscillations in um, sleep that are important for learning and memory, in particular the, spin, the slow oscillation, which is generally classified as less than one hertz, which has been shown to be that grouping rhythm with the spindles, the phase coupling with the spindles, and now the spindle, hippocampal spindle rhythms. So there are many oscillations within sleep, and the frequency does matter. Finally, I am very non-REM slow wave sleep centric but I also wanna give attention to REM sleep. And they will, this will have relevance later in the talk, but essentially um, there have been two recent studies that have reported that um, total blood flow in the cortex increases to, during REM sleep relative to non-REM and even wakefulness. And two photon microscopy has shown that this is the result of dilation of the arterials in the brain. And I'll come back to this later in the talk. And then finally, from a clinical context, I'm a neurologist and I take care of a lot of stroke patients. And we inherently know that essentially sleep and stroke are connected. And at a macroscopic scale, our stroke patients that have high sleep fragmentation or disruption seem to do worse in terms of recovery. In other words, the patients that are getting good quality sleep tend to have the greatest gain in function after having a stroke. And patients that have sleep disorders, such as obstructive sleep apnea, which is where an occlusion of the airway when you're sleeping, these patients overall do worse. So overall, on a macroscopic layer, there is a connection between sleep, um, sleep disruption and stroke outcomes. But I'm very um, oscillation specific and kind of connectivity uh, centric. And so um, what I'm going to do is that talk a little bit about how oscillations in the brain and how the networks are changing after having a stroke. Um, in particular, I'm gonna talk about two, two papers where they've applied strokes to animal models in rats, essentially. And they found that essentially after having a stroke, there's a slowing of the EEG rhythms on, and also that um, Susan Lindbergh even took it to the next step and asked questions with whether it was state dependent, where there's the loss of that high frequency activity, replacing it with low frequency, higher amplitude activity. And if you can, but these are macroscopic questions and like unihemispherically. And when they quantified what's happening on a hemispheric level, they find that essentially um, in the, uh, the power level where the power on the y-axis and um, frequency on the x-axis, um, power less than one hertz was in, the one, in one day after the lesion was significantly increased. And then Susan asked this question during non-REM sleep that there was a loss of high frequency activity and a highly variable increase in the low frequency activity. We can then ask what actually is happening on the other side of the brain. And interestingly, after three days after the lesion, they start to see this emergence of this slow oscillation, no less than one hertz. Whereas Susan didn't necessarily see this on the contralateral side, albeit a small loss in the spindle frequency range on the contralateral region. And then fully to translate this, um, Reto Huber and, and the group of Claudio Bassetti have looked at using high density EEG and stroke patients that after having a stroke, they see a pathological increase in the delta activity with a suppression or loss of ipsy lesional or nearby region areas of the stroke of delta power with a contralateral increase. 
So overall, these results suggest that slow oscillations, uh, that oscillations during sleep seem to be impacted by stroke. But unfortunately, some of these studies have had limitations, whether it's in animal models we have to, or surgical models, we have to worry about breach artifact, tissue destruction from, from invasive recordings. And while I'm a big believer in high density EEG, that's how I, what I learned as, an, as a PhD student, we do have to combat, we do have to deal about volume conduction and spatial specificity, albeit source localization and the work of the Milan group is, is really advancing this field. And unfortunately, while EEG is very informative and has good temporal resolution, we have a lot, of, a lot of difficulty looking at activity less than one hertz due to artifacts, amplifiers, and high pass filters. And so really, and even this recent paper from 2018 wasn't able to look at all frequencies of activity. We basically had, a, we cut off all the data below one hertz. And so really how these change is really kind of a fundamental question. And so do, to do that, our lab uses the wide field optical imaging that you've heard about um, from two speakers this morning as well, where we transgenically express the GCAMP6 promoter to that bind that is um, activated upon binding calcium and is expressed in thigh one pyramidal neurons. And then we take a clear plexiglass window, we track the scalp, put in tax skull and plop it down on top of the scalp. And then we can shine essentially uh, glue and green light to essentially get a direct readout of neuronal activity on, the, on a meso scale. We then combine this with traditional EEG and EMG to classify the behavioral state as either non-REM, REM, or wakefulness. And we can do record this or up, uh, continuously for three hours. And so the first question would be, well, what are this? What do these initial results suggest? So, um, at the essentially global whole brain level. And as we see here, when looking on the power on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis, we see that non-REM is associated with a global increase in the delta and the slow oscillation frequency compared to REM sleep and wakefulness. When we look at the slow oscillation frequency, we start to see this selective increase in, non in slow oscillation power in the REM, in, in during REM sleep. And so now we wanna ask, can we leverage the high spatial ability that comes with uh, wide field optical imaging to ask, are there spatial differences in, in these different frequency bands? And so what I'm showing you here is essentially the delta and the slow oscillation uh, frequency bands in non-REM, REM, and wakefulness. And to draw your attention to what's already known, we know that non-REM sleep in both human and animal studies is associated with a global increase in delta power that seems to be frontally predominant that we again see relative to non-REM and wakefulness is significantly increased. Interestingly, when we look at the slow oscillation frequency then, we see that sleep, non-REM and REM sleep combined is associated with a relative increase in global, in topographic uh, slow oscillation power. But now we're seeing increases in the motor and the visual cortices in the slow oscillation frequency band suggesting that we're having to, so uh, suggesting we're seeing new spatial, to, spatially topographic differences in different non-behavioral uh, states. Now, uh, we've also mentioned this previously a few times in talks throughout this conference, is that we can also measure connectivity of the system, essentially. To, to illustrate is that we can use seed-based, zero lag-based correlation, uh, correlation maps where we essentially choose a region of interest, I, for instance, the left motor region, and say, how much is that neuronal activity oscillating in tandem with the right motor cortex, which is the red and the black traces, respectively, yeah. in relative, and we can quantify this degree of correlation and compare it to nearby regions such as the singular cortex. And so in 2019, we published a paper looking at these functional connectivity networks of activity that are oscillating together that have good correlates in the human literature, the default mode network, the attention network, et cetera. And we see these same networks, but then when we look at this in the context of sleep-deprived state sleep, or what I showed initially at the beginning of my talk, anesthesia, we see overall increases in connectivity in sleep-deprived sleep compared to wakefulness. Now, we didn't have non-REM and REM separated because of the short recording nature of this and the, uh, the conditions of the experiment, so we then ask questions now in this recent data set, essentially now we have a, a large data set of both non-REM, REM and wakefulness. And we can look at this in different frequency bands. 
And so pulling your attention first to the delta frequency range, range during non-REM sleep, we can quantify kind of on a global level, global level, how connected each region of the cortex is to other areas of the cortex. We call this node degree. And we see that overall node degree is highest and very connected to the rest of the brain during non-REM sleep compared to REM and wakefulness. And this is consistent with many, many other papers talking about increased connectivity and decreased complexity that we see during these synchronized states of non-REM sleep, delta sleep. Additionally, when we start looking in the slow oscillation frequency range, range of less than one hertz, we see that REM sleep and non-REM sleep show these increased connectivity and essentially decreased complexity that we don't necessarily see during wakefulness. And then finally, one of the hallmark defining features of non-REM delta power is the front to back propagation of slow waves. And we, when we, can, we can actually quantify this, we can actually visualize these same front to back propagating slow waves during non-REM sleep that we do not see during wakefulness. So to summarize this first part of the talk, globally, we see an increase in the delta and the slow oscillation frequency band. We also now are seeing this increase in the slow oscillation power, oscillation power in the REM sleep, which is frontally and, and visually cortex predominant. And to put it back in the context of my initial talk, where people were seeing changes in hemoglobin and blood flow and changes in car capillary arterial, sorry, uh, diameter, we think that this is a secondary reflection of the known neurovascular coupling. As that neuronal activity goes up, capillaries dilate and blood flow increases, which is an explanation of these previous studies. We again see what's previously known of this increased high delta power in, the, um, in a spatially dependent manner. And this is associated with higher connectivity in the delta range. And we see these propagating front to back slow waves, the slow, uh, delta waves, which we think is all a manifestation of what's known at the cortical level with the pyramidal neurons going up and down or off and on. So for the second part of my talk, I'd like to ask a clinical question. In other words, how using this, this technique, how do these sleep oscillations change after stroke? So I'd first like to introduce our stroke model where we systemically in inject Rose Bengal and then expose the skull to a, photo uh, to a laser, which one exposure induces a very highly uh, reproducible and focal stroke within any region of the cortex we choose. And then within the same mouse, we can, we can serially and chronically image their essentially brain state oscillations as they change over time. So first from a macroscopic level, I, I talked about how sleep fragmentation is, is, is um, tied to sleep recovery. How does sleep and as a whole change initially, both at baseline 24 hours after a stroke, one week and then four weeks. We find that initially in the first 24 hours after a stroke, that mice have less non-REM and REM sleep with the resulting wakefulness as a, essentially a measure of sleep fragmentation, but then returns closer to backline to baseline levels and even actually shows a trend towards increasing sleep as they get more comfortable in the machine. So then let's ask questions about, um, let's leverage the wide field optical imaging regional and frequency specifications to ask questions. So just to remind you, the 2018 paper when looking macroscopically at whole hemispheric measurements. They saw a loss of high frequency and a gain, but highly variable and non-statistically significant gain in low frequency activity. And remember, I cannot, I cannot just look at just whole hemisphere, but I can use a very focal and seed bait, a region of interest based approach to ask questions, what's happening over the area of the lesion in the perilesional areas, contralesionally in the other hemisphere or in distant control regions. So for the fir I'm first going to show you what's happening over the lesional area. So what I'm showing you on the y-axis is relative change relative to baseline and on the x-axis in frequency. Initially in the first 24 hours during non-REM sleep, we see a frequency-wide suppression of neuronal activity, both in the slow oscillation and the delta range. Interestingly, at the, 20 at the one week mark, we see a highly significant increase in the slow oscillation frequency band immediately over the lesion but a continued suppression of the delta activity that over the course of one week, uh, four weeks returns back to baseline in terms of the slow oscillation, but a persistent deficit in the delta oscillation, delta waves over the area of the stroke. 
We can then look in the perilegional areas around the stroke and, and we essentially see the same trend, but to a, to a lesser magnitude than we do over the area of the stroke. Now, previously, uh, other studies have shown non-significant changes where still there was this kind of a trend. We see the same thing, where essentially when we look essentially contralesionally or directly on the other side of the cortex, we fail to see any kind of significant changes in slow oscillation or the delta frequencies, nor do we see these changes in, the re in other areas of the cortex. So overall, these suge results suggest that location, location, location matters. In other words, you need to think about both frequency and, and spatial specificity when looking at network changes, cortical network changes in sleep and after uh, neurotrauma such as stroke. To kind of um, uh, give you a spatial representation of what we were showing there in that in the frequency and power spectrum, is that now I'm quant quantifying how these changes in the slow oscillation, the delta frequency changes across the recourse of recovery. Here's our baseline slow oscillation and delta um, topography I showed you in the first part of the talk. Initially in the first 24 hours, we see actually relative to baseline, a global decrease in delta power, but it only reaches significance in the lesional and perilesional areas that you can see here by statistical non-parametric mapping. Interestingly, at the one week time point, we see that very focal and large increase in the slow oscillation power where we still see this globally persistent but non-significant decrease in the delta, delta wave power at one week. But by four weeks, this essentially acute increase in slow oscillation power is gone that we instill with persistent deficit. And when we quantify this using a region of interest-based approach, we see that again, large increase in the slow oscillation frequency power at the one week that returns back to baseline, where we see these persistent deficits in the lesional and perilesional area in the delta frequency again, suggesting that there are regionally and frequency specific changes and oscillations during non-REM sleep after stroke. Now, I mentioned also one of the other measures of connectivity I told you at the beginning of the talk. And we can also ask questions, how does the connectivity and complexity of the network change after having a stroke in particularly in these particular sleep states? So here are the baseline, essentially slow oscillation and, connect and delta uh, functional connectivity levels that I showed you previously. Here, interestingly, directing yourself to the attention to the delta range, delta range, we see immediately in the first 24 hours a loss of delta connectivity in the lesional and perilesional areas, and now a essentially increase in the contralateral connectivity over on the other side of the area of the cortex, that these changes persist all the way out to four weeks. When we look at the slow oscillation frequency band, we actually see acutely in that first 24 hours, a significant increase in that essentially connectivity that then kind of returns back to, to baseline, non-significantly back towards baseline levels, which we quantify here again in a region of interest-based approach where we see essentially the only changes per se persistently over the lesional area, where in the delta range, we see that persistent loss of the ipsilesional, ipsil, ipsilesional changes in connectivity and the contralateral increases in connectivity. So to summarize up the second part of the talk, we found that there was an increase in slow oscillation frequencies in the one week um, immediately following the stroke. And we think that this is likely due to a cortical dynamic diaphragmation. And I point your work, point you to the um, work of Steriot and then Lemieux, who then um, in 2014 in J Neuroscience showed that after um, uh, trans transecting uh, descending cortical thalamical neurons, that there was the emergence of this slow oscillation approximately 30 hours after having a stroke. And since this is a cortical stroke, we think that this is a secondary degeneration of the descending cortical thalamical neurons. And then the emergence of the intrinsic slow oscillation property of the, of the cortex. And this kind of fits with that. Mm -hmm. In addition, we've been talking a lot about um, it, uh, in the modeling talks and the simulation talks and everywhere else, we've been talking about changes in IE ballots and uh, you know, ion channels and questions about this, we are starting, and there's thought, we are starting to see changes in the connectivity of the network initially immediately at the 24 hour mark over the area within the slow oscillation frequency band. Whereas we see this change in ipsilateral to contralateral, we see this loss of over ipsilesional area of delta oscillate, delta connectivity with an increase in the contralateral region. And so 
to really tie this into our workshop here today. And I want you to tell you that I, I grew, up, grew up with sharing of data. I believe in open science. I, I really loved the, the talk um, uh, earlier today about open science, reproducibility, and replicability. And I strongly believe in this. So first, um, this, the baseline sleep data from the first part of my talk is already publicly available on physio.net. If I had known a few, even a few months earlier about eBrains and the sharing of data, I would have posted it here because I think this community is there. And I'm incredibly excited about the talk today about live papers, because I think this is the perfect example of where we can place this data to answer questions and run our an uh, the analysis. In particular, the net, right after this, we're gonna be talking up about CalSwap, which is in a beautiful analysis pipeline that can develop, wave, can detect waves and characterize these waves. And I think that this data set I have here is the perfect test data set. I'm the perfect test, one of the perfect test tutors, users for eBrains to see, can we scale this up to the international neuroscience community? And then finally, I really strongly believe in this um, community in the sense that, of the, that this thing is multimodality, multi-scale to answer fundamental questions. Can we use these analysis pathways? But more importantly, can we use this um, to validate what we're seeing as an example in these uh, simulation um, uh, modeling software, and can we use um, can we use this clinical data to uh, this clinical disease model to inform what's happening in the in the in the model, and then ultimately help our patients suffering from neurological diseases. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me. I apologize for this being virtual. I wish I could be there with you today in hot and hot Rome and stuff like that. Um, but here's a quick summary of my talk. And thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that I will be able to effectively answer your questions virtually. If not, please reach out to me via email or Twitter. Um, and we'll see you at the workshop later today.